and the reports we had on Ho Chi Minh's attitude back in 1946. He wrote, I think it was seven letters to this government and received no reply. The, 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 the pathos almost, the, uh, the sadness that here's a man who felt and believed the United States would be sympathetic to his purpose of gaining his independence from a colonial power. And then to find we, you know, he, this is what he'd read. He'd been here. He'd read our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence. He thought, surely the United States would be interested. We had testimony in the committee that his one worry was that it was so insignificant. Vietnam was so far away and so insignificant, we, we, we would never bother about it. It's too, too small for, to ever attract the attention of the United States. He was sure in his own mind that if we would ever put our minds and focus upon it, we would be for him how different history would have been for us and for them if we had felt a common interest in a colonial province like Vietnam seeking its independence of France. Uh, the uh, Ho Chi Minh of 56, I don't think, could have got elected dog catcher in South Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh uh, dead <laughs> could uh, beat any candidate we've ever put up in Vietnam. You asked me about my oldest son, Bing. He was a graduate of Harvard, 1965, and he was not a soldier in heart. Uh, he, but he realized, I'm sure there's no question, he realized that he was part of a big job that had to be done, and he was going to do it the way he did everything, full out. He went out on this mission, uh, Mead River, and it was a big assault mission, bringing elements to this area just uh, south of Da Nang along the railroad line, and they encountered heavy, sustained uh, automatic weapons fire, and the helicopter ahead of him, I believe, was, uh, uh, dis was shot down, and then he went in, and his helicopter was... Uh, uh, he was actually killed in flight. That's what these, and the airplane crashed, and uh, he and his co, he was killed. His co-pilot was very badly injured, and I think there were 12 out of 15 or 16 of the people aboard were either killed or badly hurt. <laughs> Many bombs, many coffins. These are for children. Eight or nine hundred a week. I have lost seven children myself. Many have died here. Though it's nothing like in the countryside, many more have died there. In the countryside, there are no coffins. There's no money to buy them. How did all the children die? Poison. Poison, you know. These planes keep spouting and spraying the stuff and so many people have died. It seems to destroy their intestines. With this spraying and bombing, so many have died. Each day, right on time, the bomb craters appear. Hundreds of tons are dropped each day. <coughs> And we can't talk about it. We can't talk about it because we are afraid of the government. Nice. <laughs> What'd you do? <laughs> <laughs>
shaved. <laughs> I liked it, but it melted. So what you been doing? In a little more than a week, I'll be going back to the military. You what? Why? After what they've done to you? Well, it's... It's a choice between that... or, uh, Canada, again. Or, uh, staying underground. Which is, uh, as you know, Have impossible. you been in contact with them? No. No, but I've got a lot of support. You'll get the same deal Mike's getting. Well, it's going to be a different type of thing. See, I'm going back publicly. We're having uh, ad hoc uh, congressional hearings. Yeah. It's really been building up over the past uh, couple of months now. And You're what it is... You're not going to be able to be there? Of course you're going to be there. I'm going to try to get Ronnie there, too. Because you know what I feel about the army. All these people holding their heads high because they lost the sun. Vietnam or something. I don't think that's much to be proud of. They've lost more than they'll ever gain for the rest of their life. I wanted them. I wanted them. And I remember I was sitting like at the base of the hill and I was on one of the tanks and I had an M16 and I had stacks of magazines and there were two guys, you know, that were going through like some grass and bam, I dinged in on one of them, and I nailed them, you know? And uh, the Aussie with me confirmed, you know, that I dinged them. And I felt good, and I wanted more. And it wasn't that I wanted more for politics or anything like that, no, you know? I couldn't have cared that they were whatever. I just wanted them because they were the opposition, they were the enemy. Stinking little savages. Wipe them out, I say. Wipe them out! Wipe them off the face of the earth! Will we ever understand these eastern races? Hit me, Poon, soon. You hideous yellow monster! I wanted to go out and, and kill some gooks, you know. I, I, I really... I, I don't know, I, I guess I had been totally brainwashed because I could remember when when people used to call me blanket ass or, or chief, and they still did, you know. I, I think the my name was uh, Ira Hayes in boot camp, either Ira Hayes or Squaw, depending on what type of mood the drill instructor was in. But there I was, you know, saying, I want to go kill some gooks, you know. They were instructed um, to remove the eyes of the individual and place them in the hole in the middle of the back. And that would say to the Vietnamese, you have to understand, uh, that whoever did that, was ubiquitous. In other words, the eye being the symbol of ubiquity uh, or of all present, uh, all powerfulness on the part of the Saigon government, which is an easy message for the local villagers to get. In fact, the American advisors didn't have that much of a stomach for the thing, so they used to use CBS uh, logos, you know, the eye of CBS, and they would, um, they would kill the individual and then they would leave him with a kind of a calling card on him. At one point, I was invited to go along on an airborne uh, interrogation in a helicopter with the Marines northwest of Da Nang. And they took along two Vietnamese. And the one was already reduced by beatings uh, with a rubber hose and some other methods of, of uh, beating and torture to the point where he couldn't talk, he couldn't respond. And as an example to the one they wanted to question, they would say, uh, if you don't tell us what we want to know, we're going to throw you out of the helicopter. And uh, he couldn't respond. He didn't understand. They were using uh, pidgin Vietnamese, which he didn't understand. That was more English than Vietnamese. They'd run him up to the helicopter, two hefty EM were along, and they would take him by each elbow, and they'd run him up to the door of the helicopter. And they did this three or four times, and he was reduced to whimpering and crying. And they finally um, uh, told him that this was the last run, and he still responded the same way, and they just winged him out of the helicopter. The second fellow immediately started to babble anything he could tell them, any kind of, of information he could give them for one goal, and that was to reach the ground alive again. I just can't see in my mind, like you said, somebody throwing something out of a helicopter. I don't, I don't believe this kind of stuff happened. Maybe it did. I don't know. I never saw it, put it that way. Uh, 
I've seen GIs get mad and uh, uh, rather than shoot a, shoot one of these dinks, uh, just punch him right out yeah. with his hand. Americans say the Vietnamese are just slant-eyed savages. The Vietnamese have 5,000 years of history. We fight against the invaders. It is not we who are the savages. The dude in the foxhole with me, he was dead. And like, you know, here come the Jets and everybody's, yay, Jets, you know, do it to him and all this shit, you know, get these motherfuckers off our ass, you know. Because they were digging in our behind real good. And like the Jet came in and he said, yay, Jet, get him. And you see him swooping on around, yay, Jet, get him. And he came over that way and let it go and he said, uh-oh, you know, and you can see it's napalm canister because you can tell them because they spin ass overhead, you know, backwards as they're tumbling through the air like coming big down. Silver dollar. And the thing is just tumbling down and you know it's coming right at you, you know. And like, wow, the napalm hit. I grabbed this dude and just put him up over my head in the hole like that. The fucking napalm went down the whole line, man, just creamed. Everybody in the line, 35 dudes, man, just burnt post-toasty to the bitter, you dig. And the napalm was just dripping in on both sides of this dude. He's dead, you know, I'm just holding him up, using him as a shield. So I just chunked this dude off of me and just sprung out of the hole. And I didn't know which way I was going outside the back. You dig, and just ran through, burned my pants off, spent the rest of the battle running around with no drawers. My stuff just hanging out all over the place, you know, and all that. You ever try to fight a battle without any drawers on, man? Oh, I'll be so glad to go home. I don't know. It's the worst area we've been in since I've been in Vietnam. You think it's worth it? Yeah, I, I don't know. They, they say it was fighting for something. I don't know. I was at a very kind of sobering thing last night, a memorial service for four men in the second squadron who were killed the other day, one of them being a medic. And uh, the place was just packed. And we sang three hymns and had a nice prayer. I turned around and looked at their faces and they were, I was just proud. My, my uh, feeling for America just soared because of their, the, the way they looked. They looked determined and, and, and reverent at the same time, but still they're a bloody good bunch of killers. When you go forth to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid. Well, let's not anybody be so naive as to think we're here in any way to worship football. Nor are we here, as I'm sure many people believe, to pray for a victory. We believe in victory. We believe it'll come to the team that's best prepared. This is serious business that we're involved in. And that's religious, and God cares. They're going to be men made tonight. And that's religious, and God cares about that. We're concerned about the big game, but we're also concerned about the bigger game, the biggest game of all that surrounds us, the game of life. May you be winners. Winners in the big game, but even more importantly, winners in the biggest game of all, which we all play. Let us pray. That's touchdown. Because we got our kids geared to track like hell.
gotta tell them they're number one, no matter what happens to them. You're number one. Oh, wow. Why don't you just say well? Say what? Toyoi means well? Toyoi? Yeah. Me. Like, Toyoi means like, wow, you know? Mm -hmm. Hey, you should you should check out the hickeys I gave this chick, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one on each side. <laughs> it's a place where she can't hide them. Oh, really? Yeah. See, this one right here. Yeah, but this one. And this one, this is the first one right there. It came out of kind of nasty, you know. No, uh, no, no can do. I know. Maybe he did. He's not dead. Wake him up. Okay, wake him up. What? Why he up? He don't know how to do. Huh? Why he's no hot? Cause you know, wake him up. Hey, Charles, you getting anything out of yours? What do you mean? This one's uh, starting to go kind of sour on me, you know. Uh. So oh, keep it going, that. man. Huh? Keep it going. I'm trying to. But, well, uh, try. You know what it is about these chicks down here, you know, like they're, uh, well, what would you want to do except for, you know, have a ball and, uh, right? Hey, hey you're number one. <laughs> this one got a set of knockers. Oh, this one is stupid. but you won't take your goddamn bra. Uh, I'll take it off for her. Take it off for her? That's the name of the game. <laughs> It's about time. <laughs> it took you long enough, you know that. <laughs> oh yeah. Check it out, baby. Check it out later, man. Check it out later. <laughs> you know, if my chick at home could see this now, man, she'd flip. enjoy it, some don't. Some just go out and do it as a job. It's a daily grind. What is it for you? I enjoy it. Now I know that he will have a very important message for each one of us. So I want you all to listen very attentively what he has to say to you, Lieutenant Copeland. Well, if you ever have to go to a war, and unfortunately, someday, you probably will have to fight a war, you'll find out that life becomes very simple because the only thing you're concerned about is living and dying. Everything else is unimportant. 
because suddenly your life is at stake. And that's what it's like to be when you become a prisoner, particularly if it's a prisoner of war. Because the thing that got us through were the things that we learned before we were 10 years old. I'd like to open up the questions now. Just raise your hand or yell it out, and you can ask any question you want about anything, and I'll do the best I can to answer them. How did you feel when the Vietnam War was over? How did I feel when the war was over? I felt real good, real good. It was a long war and a very difficult war to understand, but the reason we went there was to win this war. I volunteered to go. I would go again if I had to, and we wanted to win. That was our number one ambition. That was what we really wanted was to win this war. It took us a long time, so when it was finally over, when we knew that we had won, we felt great. We really felt great. What did Vietnam look like? What did Vietnam look like? Well, if it wasn't for the people, it was very pretty. Uh, the people over there are very backward and very primitive, and they just make a mess out of everything. How did you, how did, um, what do you feel about the people that um, went and burned their draft cards and went into Canada? We don't agree with them. I think these people were legally wrong. I think sometimes they were cowards. If they wanted to leave and go to Canada, that's okay. But they can't come back, though. It was they, they have disagreed. They say, we don't like your country. We don't like you, your people. They're saying that to you and me. You know, I don't like you, so I'm leaving. Well, fine, that's okay. There's no reason to hate a guy for that. Because that's also his right. But he can't come back. Instead of helping and aiding the Vietnamese people, I saw that we were party to their deliberate and systematic destruction. The Vietnamese were considered all considered less than humans, inferiors. We called them gooks, slopes. Their lives weren't worth anything to us because we've been taught to believe that they were all fanatical and that they were all VC or VC sympathizers, even the children. Many of us, however, began to understand through our personal experiences in Vietnam the depth of the lies and deceptions practiced upon us and the American people by our country's leaders. It was they who trained us to kill without question and to hate our enemy, the Vietnamese. They concocted such phrases as kill ratios, search and destroy, free fire zones, secure areas, and so on to mask the reality of their combat policy in Vietnam. I make no apology for this act of resistance. I could do nothing else at the time. But underground life has become intolerable to me. So I'm here today to draw attention to the true facts concerning my case and the cases of tens of thousands just like me. We are not criminals to be hunted and, and imprisoned. Over a half million of us have deserted the military since 1965. Most of us have already returned to the military to be punished with jail and bad discharges that will be carried around for the rest of our lives. And it is a supreme irony to be prosecuted by the very same men who planned and executed a genocidal war in Indochina. Now, inside this hearing room, Eddie Souders has surrendered himself. Urged on, he says, by a hand-to-mouth underground existence, which still nags at many of his fellow deserters who continue to look over their shoulders. Paul Udell, NBC News, Washington. How was your sound? One more time. Let me respectfully tell the American people that this is their dirtiest and longest war. The Vietnamese fight only in self-defense. Ultimately, the Americans will see the light. If not, they will defeat themselves. You know, Vietnam uh, reminded me of a, of a child, the developing of a child. The laws of nature control the development of this child. The child has to sit up before it crawls. It has to crawl before it walks. It has to walk before it runs. No matter how many decades America fights, it will never conquer Vietnam, never. I'm telling you so that you will go back and repeat it to President Nixon. Over here, as long as there is rice to eat, we'll keep fighting. And if the rice runs out, then we'll plow the fields and fight again.
I know very little about it over there, I'll tell you. And the le less I know, the better off I'll be. It, uh, it has not affected me a whole lot. I mean, the American, uh, the, the way of life is still here. And uh, if you work for it, it's there for you. But we're taught that we're to obey our governments. And I would have to go if I was instructed to. Once in a while I think about it, but I like to think about the things that are happening right now to me. I don't think it's affected mine at all. I don't even know who we're fighting for over there, to be real honest with you. I think we're fighting for the North Vietnamese, ain't we? I fled from Dao Tien to go live in Sui Dua. Then I was allowed to go back. I went back and stayed in Benchua. While I was in Benchua, trouble broke out again. So I was taken up to Koh Tak. I was picked up again and sent to Benchua to be lumped together with the others. My house burned down while I was away. Once more, I got sent to Koh Tak. I fled five, six, at least seven times already. The lives of my countrymen are worth no more than that of a fly. You take it and swat it dead. Just like that. Ladies, let me tell you. There once were some women amusing themselves, and one pushed the other onto a table. The ladies' falsies broke the table in two. If a table breaks, think of what would happen to a man's face. Watch it, they're filming. Don't make jokes. People in America will think we're ridiculous. We have about 15 companies now, including uh, insurance company and uh, tractor company. We are in the hotel business, in the travel agency business. We are the exclusive dealer for Ford in the country, Ford cars, oh, many, many other things, uh, like uh, an oil company in the forming. We uh, have a bottling company. In other words, uh, we, greatly, we greatly believe in the future of this country, and uh, we think there's a great future for Vietnam, and uh, we think that uh, Vietnam will be livable will not go communist, because otherwise all these companies will go to waste. And the way we work is we, we take a calculated risk. If we don't lose South Vietnam within the next three to five years, then nobody can catch up with us. I'm a Johnny-come-lately, as far as war profiteering is concerned. Uh, the reason why I uh, organized this group of companies is because when I, you know, was in Paris, I saw that peace was coming whether we liked it or not. Therefore, I got home in order to prepare for peace. All these companies have been organized uh, in order to prepare for, for peace and prepare for the economic takeoff that will come with peace. Like we have the infrastructure of hotels, of travel agencies and things like that, but of course, there are no tourists in Vietnam now, but there will be. And uh, we are getting ready for that sort of thing.